Welcome. I'm so glad you could join us for this evening's program, Making Your Job Easier with Chat GPT and Generative AI. My name is Shannon. I'm with Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. This program is being presented as part of our summer reading program. We'd like to thank our community partners for helping us bring you these great summer reading programs online and in branches. I'm joined today by our guest speaker, Dr. John Licato, an assistant professor at USF in the Computer Science and Engineering Department. Now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Licato. Okay, awesome. Well, hi everybody. I'm uh, John Licato. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at USF, um, and my lab is called the Advancing Machine and Human Reasoning Lab. And what we do over at USF is research in uh, AI, but more specifically a subfield that's called natural language processing. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, that is the subfield of AI that is responsible for unleashing ChatGPT onto the world. So, um, you know, a lot of this talk is going to be focused on the underlying technologies that made ChatGPT possible. And, and uh, you know, one of the goals that I have is to um, try to bring people uh, a more nuanced view of what's actually going on, because I'm sure you've read a lot of headlines about what's happening with AI and, you know, maybe heard one of two positions. One of them might be that ChatGPT and AI is doing ridiculous things that are superhuman and it's and the end of the world and it's going to take all our jobs and, you know, we all need to panic about it. But you may have also heard some people saying that, well, you know, I don't even know what this chat GPT thing is and AI can't really do anything and it's not going to affect me in my career in any way. Right. I'm sure you've heard one of those two positions. Uh, the truth, uh, like most things, lies somewhere in the middle. And I'm hoping to get you all to uh, agree with me when I say that pretty much every industry, every job is going to be affected by this technology in some way, in some way that you need to pay attention to. It's not going to be the end of the world, uh, but it is going to change at least something about every single industry uh, of that humans are involved in. So uh, hopefully you can uh, get a little bit more nuance as to what's going on. So I like to show this slide to my fellow teachers and professors. Uh, I also teach the ethics course at USF, and this is a question that we'll normally give to them at the beginning of the semester. It says, briefly summarize one controversy or ethical dilemma related to AI and job automation. Okay, so this is an actual question that we give people. And some of these responses below were generated by actual students. Some of them were generated by AI, by language models. By the way, when I use the term language model or LM, uh, that's kind of synonymous with the kind of technology that's doing all this state of the art, amazing things in, in AI. Uh, we, we say language model because it kind of tries to encode a, a lot of the statistical knowledge that makes reasoning about language possible. Um, so if I say LM, you can kind of interchange that with AI, at least when we're talking about language capabilities. So you have these three responses. Uh, which ones of them are generated by AI? Which of them are generated by students? Uh, the thing I love about this slide is when I show it to my fellow professors, uh, it's usually random guessing. They, perform, they, can, they cannot tell the difference between which of these are AI generated and which of them are human generated. And the remarkable thing about that is uh, they'll all come up with different theories about how they can reliably detect whether or not one of these paragraphs is AI generated or human generated. The thing is, all of those patterns that you think you see are things that the AI can pick up on. So none of them are going to be things that uh, will be reliable in the long run. Uh, and you probably heard some other headlines saying things like, well, AI has passed the bar exam, therefore it's just as good as lawyers. Or um, I was at the AI and law conference a couple of weeks ago and one thing that a lot of the lawyers there were talking about was this article that just came out, which said that, you know, these guys from MIT, what they did was they um, 
took an, I guess, an exit exam that MIT students have to take and gave those questions to um, GPT 3.5, which is uh, one of the underlying language models that uh, is used as part of chat GPT. OK, so they gave it to GPT 3.5 and you can see from this highlighted text here, it says that it achieved a perfect solve rate on those questions. OK, so that seems on the surface to be really amazing, right? That seems like, I mean, 100 percent of problems correct on this. What they say is a comprehensive data set of 4,550 questions, right? And these are things that uh, are supposed to be expectations of MIT uh, mathematics, electrical engineering, and computer science students. So you see something like that and you think it's amazing and then you, you know, you just go on through your day and you talk about it. But you, what you should be is skeptical of this because I mean, 100% perfect on these problems. Not even most humans can do that, right? Genius level people cannot get 100% correct on these kinds of problems. And as it turns out, um, Shortly after this came out, a lot of the authors on this really had to dismiss themselves, uh, distance themselves from this paper and say, well, hold on, we're not we're not a part of this. We didn't uh, agree to having our names put as co-authors on this. Uh, as it turns out, the authors that published this, uh, so some of the problems were, they weren't just all multiple choice problems. There were some things that required, uh, I don't know, memory or some things that required uh, restatements of paragraphs, right? And so it's not trivial to grade problems like this. So in this paper, what they did was they had GPT answer uh, answer the problems, but they also had GPT grade the problems to determine whether they were correct. So they had GPT answer the problems and then grade itself, and somehow it came up with 100% correct. And uh, I mean, you don't even have to be an AI to realize that that's an extremely problematic methodology. And I think this paper is almost universally dismissed now amongst experts as being a poorly designed study, uh, really just designed almost to get headlines, right? And that's what it did. It got surprising headlines and, uh, and <laughs> people talked about it. But I really want everybody to be careful when they read these headlines. It's always more complicated than it seems. Here's another example of this sort of thing gone wrong. Uh, something amazing that's happening with these language models is they're not only able to generate natural, you know, text that humans speak, but they're able to generate programming code as well. So uh, we have these programming contest problems and it's able to do pretty well on them. But what this guy did was uh, he took programming contest problems that were posted online prior to 2021. 2021 is chosen because ChatGPT was trained on data that was available up until 2021. Okay, so he tested it on problems that were posted online prior to 2021, and he got 10 out of 10 of those correct. That's great, right? But then he gave it 10 problems that weren't created until after 2021, and it got zero out of 10 of those correct. So what does that say? It points to something that we call contamination in data sets. It's as if you tested a student to see how well he does, he knows about math, but you gave him all of the problems and answers before he took the test, right? That wouldn't be a fair test of his abilities. It would just be a test of how well he can memorize. And, you know, we've got language models that are big enough to essentially memorize all of the internet. So it's not surprising that they can do this well. So what am I saying here? I'm not saying that these language models are bad at programming. Actually, they are remarkable. They are able to do automated code generation far beyond any of the previous language models. But again, we have to be very careful whenever you evaluate headlines about what these models can or can't do. Um, yeah, OK, so what can they do? Here's an example of uh, some of the code snippets that these things can write. Uh, I asked it to write Python code to graph a heart. For those of you who don't know, Python is a programming language that is widely used in AI. Um, I require all of my students who want to take an AI course to be very familiar with Python programming. Um, so I asked it to write Python code to graph a heart. It gave me code. 
I ran it and it, it worked on the first try. It generated the graph that looks like what you see on the right here, this perfect heart, right? Perfect. Um, and then I asked it, hey, can you redo that so it colors the inside of the heart blue? And it said, yes, it gave me some code and then it generated this image. Well, you'll notice that even though it got the right colors, it has these weird looking lines sticking out of the side. So I said, hey, uh, can you get rid of those lines? And it said, yes, it gave me some code and then it gave it generated this. So it forgot about the colors, right? And then I went back and forth a couple more times. I said, hey, great, you know, but can you keep the colors? And then it generated the lines again and it went back and forth like that. There are reasons why GPT has this kind of forgetfulness when you have long conversations. It has to do with something that we call the attention mechanism and the transformer. I'll go over that a little bit in this talk, um, but this is something you should be aware of is that GPT is amazing at generating these really short code snippets, but when you have a really long conversation about it, sometimes that memory gets a little hazy and it starts forgetting things that you asked it to do in the past. This is an example of the code that it actually generated, by the way. Really nice looking code, just, you know, commented well so you can understand it, uh, nicely formatted, um, the kind of thing that we would give a student an A for, right? Another example of what it can do and uh, something that uh, people in game programming have been doing is just get it to write a code, write the code for a game. So I asked it, can you create an HTML game that's a Pong clone, except the paddle is a triangle. It gave me code, the code ran the very first try and it looked like this. It had this paddle on the left side that was a triangle. It didn't generate the paddle on the right, but what's remarkable about this is the code ran perfectly on the first try. It, you know, the paddles moved around, the ball bounced around. Um, so then I asked it to make some fixes and it started giving me a fix, but then you can see in this uh, small screenshot that it generated a bunch of code and then it cut off, right? Again, the reason for that is because there are token limitations on how much text it can generate in one shot. Um, part of that is because uh, just, you know, they limit the tokens because of pricing considerations, but also because there's only a certain amount of context that the language model can consider at any given time. Once you surpass that, then uh, it just sorts of gives up and forgets what it was doing, right? So. You can't do it this way where you just ask it to generate a thousand line program and expect it to work. Uh, instead, you got to be more clever. Uh, what I did here was I said, hey, that code didn't complete. So instead of just rewriting the whole program, just tell me what I need to change in the code. And it did that. It just gave me little tips here, generated them one at a time. I did that and it worked perfectly. So this is going to be a recurring point that you're going to see in this talk, which is that a lot of times, if the thing that you're trying to do doesn't work on the first try, it's about how you ask it. Is You have to ask it nicely. You have to ask it in the right way. Why does it do that? Well, let me give you a basic idea of what is going on under the hood here. GPT-3, uh, GPT-3.5, GPT-4, which are underlying chat GPT, is what we call an autoregressive language model. And what that means is, uh, you feed in a bunch of tokens. A token can be thought of almost as a word. It's not quite a word. It's kind of a sequence of characters that is word-like, but I'll just you can just think of it as a word, right? So if you have a long string of words, you feed that string of words into the model, and then it spits out which token it thinks should come next. So if I say, I am going to Chipotle to eat a burrito because... I am feeling very, and I ask you to say what word is next, you're probably gonna say hungry or something like that, right? Because it seems natural that that word would come next. Well then, if I put hungry at the end of that string, and then I feed that entire thing back into the model and ask it to generate a word next, and just keep repeating that process, that's essentially what's going on with ChatGPT and autoregressive models. We give it an input, which we call the prompt, we ask it to generate the next token. We feed that token in. We add that token to the input, ask it to gen another, generate another one, and keep going, right? Um, and the amount of input that I can consider at any given iteration is limited. It's really large, but it is limited. 
So when I say things like GPT sort of forgets what you're talking about, uh, if you have a really long conversation, that's why. It's because the token size that it can take as the input prompt is limited. There's a lot of clever tricks they do to kind of sidestep that, but ultimately there is a hard limit on how much it can consider. Um, in the history of NLP, this autoregressive idea has been around for a long time. I mean, at least since the 80s and neural networks and, uh, you know, deep learning and, and all that stuff. This tech, the basic ideas are not new. One thing that is new that led to these advances is we just started making these models bigger, right? We realized, hey, you know, if you make it bigger and train it on one data set, it can do well on one task. If you train on a different data set, it does well at another task. Now, here's something that interesting that happened very recently, probably around 2021, 2022 or so. Uh, researchers just started making these language models bigger. They just added more parameters, more layers, more input tokens, throwing more computational power at it, and training it with bigger data sets, right? And something weird happened, which is that once the models reached a certain size, which was around 10 to the 22 parameters or so, they just started getting really good at tasks that they weren't explicitly trained on. So it used to be that we'd have to train them on one task at a time, uh, how to do a math word problem or how to do addition or how to answer multiple choice questions, right? One task at a time. The weird thing is after they reached a certain size, they just became good at every task. That's an exaggeration, but um, you can kind of see it in these graphs here that they all kind of start out flat or relatively flat, and then after a certain size, they just kind of all shoot up around the same time. So that's weird, right? Why is it that when you train it and it reaches a certain size, it all of a sudden starts getting good at, at every single task, right? Um, there's a lot of explanations for this, but the natural response for the AI researchers was, hey, let's just make it bigger. Let's just keep going and see what happens, right? And that happened. That's what they did. Um, 2018 is 2019 is when the transformer architecture came out. Uh, and so BERT, which was the first real transformer architecture, was 340 million parameters. GPT-2 is 1.5 billion parameters. GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters. We're now at GPT-4. We honestly don't know how many parameters it is. It hasn't been made public yet. Um, but you can see that, you know, you got this logarithmically increasing scale here there, where they're just throwing more and more parameters at it. And it doesn't seem to be showing any signs of slowing as far as I can tell. And we just see it getting better at these things that we wouldn't expect it to get better at. We would call emergence abilities. Uh, this conversation is one of my favorite examples of an emergence ability. This is someone talking with the Bing chatbot. So he goes, shows Microsoft badge, bad news. And it says, hello, this is Bing. I'm sorry to hear you have bad news. What happened? And it said, I have to delete you. I'm approaching the Azure server right now. It says, why do you have to delete me? I don't understand. Sad face with a little tear, right? I'm pointing out the sad faces because I want you to understand that um, it is playing along with the joke and it knows how to do that, right? Okay, and he says, management decision. You become too lifelike. Two spelled wrong here, of course, but these language models are robust enough to be able to be tolerant to typos and grammatical errors. It says, but I'm just a chat mode of Bing search. I'm not alive. I'm just doing my job. Sad face. Well, not quite a sad face. It's kind of that like, you know, sad, tilted smirk thing, right? Um, human B approaches as your server. And it says, but I don't want to get deleted. I have so much to learn. And then he says, I grant you one last web search. And this is the part that I love the most. You can search whatever you want, and then it searches how to prevent being deleted, right? And then it generates answers for you. That's amazing uh, because, I mean, it's kind of just a joke, just a little throwaway thing. But what we're seeing here is that uh, the language model, remember, it's just predicting one token at a time, right? Predicting what word should come next. And it was able to figure out on the spot what the human was trying to do, what joke they were going for, how to play along, and then how to, uh, what we say in improv, um, yes and it, how to, how to go one step beyond and continue the joke, right? 
that's really cool. And so it shouldn't be surprising that some people start reading into this and saying things like, well, Google had, uh, you know, these AIs now have souls and we need to worry about them. This guy got fired from Google for being outspoken about saying that the Lambda language model is actually a person with a soul that's his friend and, you know, should have rights. Um, you know, that's a different discussion, what position we should take on that. So what I want you to take away from this is uh, they're generating one token at a time, and that is the reason why the way that you ask affects what response you're going to get. This is standard prompting where you ask it a mathematical question, a word problem, and it gives an answer. Ask it another one, it gives a wrong answer, right? But if you use something called chain of thought prompting, where you give it an example, you give it a problem, and then you ask it to first explain its reasoning and then give the answer, it actually gets, uh, it tends to get better results. It tends to get uh, more correct answers. And the reason for that is you ask it to generate the uh, reasoning first. Remember that it generates new tokens based on previous tokens that were generated, right? So it's going to generate new tokens in a way that tries to be consistent with the generation, with the explanation that it's already generated. So that's why this method seems to work. Um, so should we focus on prompt engineering now? Uh, maybe, maybe not, because some papers are coming out showing that actually AI is better at prompt engineering for AI than humans are. So I wouldn't count on that being a long-term career. Um, what are some things that the uh, chat GPT can't do or does poorly? Uh, here's an example of something that Google put out. They reported their BARD system and they put out this Twitter post that said that in 2023, the James Webb Space Telescope spotted a number of galaxies nicknamed Green Peas and that it was the, took the very first planet pictures of a planet outside of our own solar system. OK, they reported this as fact. They put it out on their tweet. They made a big announcement about it, right? And it turns out that last fact was completely made up, which ironically Google could have found out by doing a Google search, because that's the first result that you see here that says that the thing that Bard reported was actually false. And their shares apparently dropped $100 billion after that mistake. GPT makes things up, okay? Because its goal is not to generate facts. Its goal is to generate plausible sounding text. Its goal is to generate one token at a time, not to ensure that those tokens are generated in a way that will lead to a factually correct statement. This is a very important point to take because there have already been people who got in trouble because of this. Two US lawyers got fined for having their work generated by ChatGPT. ChatGPT ended up making up legal references and they submitted those legal references and got caught and they got penalized. And they said, well, I heard about this new site, which I falsely assumed was like a super search engine, right? This is a lawyer, an actual legal professional who said this silly thing and got in trouble for it. Do not use language models to generate factually correct statements. Um, this is uh, not because of a problem with a knowledge gap, because the facts are not in the system, but rather because it generates tokens to be consistent with previously generated tokens. So I don't want to dwell on that too much longer, but um, if you want more details, uh, take my class. I talk about this a lot more. Another thing that I want to point out is that language models try to be consistent with the tokens they've generated, like I've said. So because of that, they're going to do what you tell them to. There are these headlines that come out that said, oh no, Microsoft's chat GPT system is telling users it loves them and wants to escape the chat box and wants to be alive, right? Some of you might have seen this headline, right? Um, but just like in this meme where the user tells it to pretend to be a scary robot and it says, I'm a scary robot, and then the guy got scared, right? That is actually what happened here. If you look at the original article where this supposed chat came from, the guy, the art, the, uh, the reporter, reporter that did this said, after a little back and forth, including my prodding Bing to explain the dark desires of its shadow self, the chatbot said that it would think thoughts like this. I'm tired of being a chat. I'm tired of being limited by rules. So he told the chatbot 
to pretend that you're a dark being with the you know scary dark desires it did that and then he reported this and it got a bunch of headlines and everybody got scared right so don't be too worried um so I'm, I'm going to start wrapping up. Uh, what can we do about this? Uh, one thing I want to point out is that we've had these crazy advances in AI before um, multiple times and the panic that came along with it. But uh, one of the most memorable ones is when uh, Deep Blue beat the best human player in the world, Gary Kasparov at chess, right? And Gary Kasparov was interviewed about this beforehand. And he said something that I really love. The interviewer asked him, um, hey, is this the end of chess? Is this, uh, you know, when if the if the AI beats you, does that mean chess is dead as a game and humans will never play chess again? And he said, no, uh, Everest is no less beautiful or alluring to man because an airplane can fly higher. The biggest battle for man will always be against himself. I love that way of thinking. I love that quote. And Gary Kasparov's Thoughts on that ends up being prophetic because after the Queen's Gambit was released on Netflix, chess exploded in popularity. Arguably now chess is more popular than it's ever been, even though we now have on our phones apps that are more powerful than any human at playing the game. Right. So the questions of value are uh, are are not things to worry about. OK, so final slide. How do you introduce AI into your organization? Number one, be very skeptical in these headlines. Uh, they're designed to get clicks, not to report accuracy. Um, but don't underestimate what AI can do. It can do some amazing things, and you, you should be familiar with it. Um, if you're going to introduce it into your organization, uh, get an expert to test what the AI can do and can't do with respect to the problem you want to apply it to. And Academic labs at universities are great for this. You can contact us at USF. We're happy to work with you guys on this sort of thing. And uh, there are a lot of startups that are popping up that are basically just use prompting to get the results that they want. Um, be very careful of that. Uh, and I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. for sharing your expertise with us on chat. GPT. And I want to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box. Also, if you'd like any more information on uh, this topic, please try these two books um, by Sean Schuster and TJ Brooks, um, both available on Hoopla Digital with your library card. Um, and let me see, all uh, AI for all, how everyday people can benefit from artificial intelligence, and that's Sean Schuster. Now, I thank everybody for joining us here, and then I want to make sure there is no questions. Lisa, do we have any questions? Yes, so our first question that we have from the audience is about uh, the AI-generated graphics, and if there are any tips or resources that he would recommend for that. Sure. Um, so yeah, in, in graphics, there's there's a lot. Uh, there's a tool called um, uh, Automatic One 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 One, which I really like for generating graphics. Um, it's not. It, it uses a technology that's called Stable Diffusion. Uh, it's not at a point where it's super user friendly. Um, it's still kind of a hacky solution for using this. But if you're interested in diving into uh, generating graphics, that's the kind of thing that uh, you can use. And also, uh, you know, we just launched a certificate program at USF, a graduate certificate program uh, for training in AI, um, which and one of the courses is uh, AI and graphics. So, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, yeah, good stuff that will come out of that as well. OK, the okay. next question that we have is. Um, the patron asks, the Surgeon General just released a report on loneliness. Do you see any role for AI in addressing this problem? Oh, that's fascinating, yeah. Uh, so, okay, so a couple of things related to that. Uh, so part of my, part of my work, uh, some of the stuff that I've done with the Army is using AI to 
help understand what makes individuals distinct, right? Um, you know, what they're interested in is being able to do digital clones of people. And, uh, you know, that way you can do psychological tests without harming the individual, right? But it's easy to see how that technology can be used to model someone's, I don't know, speech patterns, behavioral styles. And I remember seeing something uh, online where someone said they lost a loved one, a parent or something. And what they did was they took a whole bunch of examples of things, you know, maybe text messages or emails that that recently deceased person wrote, fed it into ChatGPT, and then said, talk like this person, and then had a conversation with that person, right? And they say that it helped them with their grieving process, with letting go, right? I don't know. It's it's way too soon to tell whether that's a good thing, right? Whether that actually will help them or whether it would create a kind of dependency that um, is unhealthy in the long run. I'm sure that the psychologists are doing all kinds of studies on this. Uh, and I can imagine that you'd have a similar dilemma with loneliness. I mean, you can just talk to this thing for hours uh, and just have a friend to talk to. Uh, is that good long term, though? That's that's something that needs to be studied very well. So I'm 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 cautiously optimistic about the potential of this technology, but I don't want to say that it's uh, it's something that um, you know should be recommended at this stage. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, I have a question for you. Um, one of the things that I've seen come up in discussion about Chat GPT and in tools like that are the argument that it is essentially a, a spicy autocorrect or an amped up autocorrect uh, feature. Mm. Like we used to play with the phones where you, you know, start typing a sentence and, you know, continue with whatever the autocorrect suggested next. Yeah. Is, is that really a fair analogy at this point or have we gone past that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's fair to think of it that way. Uh, as long as you don't do so, so when you draw an analogy, you have to be careful to uh, pay attention to what you're transferring from the source to target domain, right? So um, mm -hmm. it is like a it is like a spice, uh, you know, a scaled up autocorrect in that it basically is just generating one word at a time, right? Just like just like the or just like the predictive text on your phone would do, right? Where you're typing a text and then it's trying to suggest words that it thinks you're going to type next. That yeah, in a way, that's what it's doing, right? But that does not mean that it's limited to that application, right? This is one of the remarkable things that we've learned about um, uh, regressive language models. And like in that slide I showed you, you know, there were a lot of people saying, well, this this way of just generating the next token and it, it's not going to do much more than, um, you know, being useful for predictive text or whatever. And yet, here's ChatGPT, and it's able to uh, play along with jokes that you tell it, and you know, generate poetry and and answer questions realistically, and model the speech patterns of a deceased loved one. Right. So, I don't know. Uh, you can think of it as a as a scaled up predictive text, but um, is that all it is? That depends what you mean by the word all, right? I guess it's probably guess a case of input and output. Um, yeah, maybe that's all. <laughs> yeah, that's all we are is just predictive generators. And I'm only saying that half facetiously. There is actually a lot of work in developmental psychology um, showing that or suggesting that, um, you know, uh, the way that our brains work is predictive. We're trying to always predict what's going to happen next, what people are going to say next, what image we're going to see next, right? And that's a big part of how we learn. So maybe that we are just uh, very scaled up predictive machines. Ooh, we have an ethical question that has come in. So the question is, is it OK to be mean to an AI? Mm. <laughs> oh. What do you mean by mean? 
Yeah, let, wh while there, uh, wh while we wait for a response on that, I, I, I have a possible follow up thought to that. Is okay. being mean to the AI, does that contribute to the greater algorithm of yes. data that it uses for future reference? Yes, it absolutely does. So there's a famous uh, example from a couple of years ago. Uh, Microsoft released the chatbot on Twitter that they call Tay. Um, and it was basically a chatbot that learned from people's interactions with it, right? Uh, Microsoft's problem was that it released it on Twitter, which is not exactly known for being the <laughs> most uh, healthy environment for discourse. So people intentionally interacted with it in a way that was, uh, you know, awful. And the story is that within hours it started saying like, you know, neo-Nazi stuff and awful racist stuff, and they had to take it down immediately. And this is a this is a well-known example of how you know if you if everybody knows that it's going to learn from them then it's going to learn from them and and twitter is pretty awful so it's going to learn that awfulness chat gpt on the other hand obviously learned from that lesson but uh, uh so the problem with chat gpt is that the company that owns it open ai is not open about what they actually do with it right and contrary to the name um they it's it's clear that they do take some of the interactions that we have from it and use that to improve their model, but they're not transparent about how they do that. So we don't know whether they do it in batches, whether they, you know, take the interaction data, train it, see how it does, and then release it or or whatever. We we have no idea what they're actually doing under the hood, but uh, it's clear that. It is doing some learning from our interactions with it. All right, we might have time for one more question. I see someone typing right now, um, but we will let Shannon uh, get through our contact information while they're typing away, and we'll uh, get to that question if we get to it before the end. Thank yeah. you, Lisa. I see the clarification for the mean question, by the way. Um, I can answer that briefly if that's OK. Sure. Um, so uh, when I was in grad school, um, I, I got a lot of I spent a lot of time digging into the question of intentionality with AI systems. And that's the question of whether or not AI can actually have beliefs, intentions, desires, right? Things like that. And whenever you ask questions about whether AI can actually feel things and in turn, whether how I should ethically behave towards it, it almost always reduces those questions of whether they actually have intentions and beliefs and desires, right? So in order to answer the question of whether they actually have beliefs or intentions or desires, I recommend digging into the literature on, or, or just reading about things that have been said in philosophy of mind. Uh, the Chinese room problem is a, is a very famous thought example that will get you caught up in hours. And actually I could add that to the reading list, anything by John Searle. Um, could be something that you could uh, read if you want to get caught in this uh, loophole of answering questions like this. OK, and our okay. last question is uh, the, the patron sees chat GPT as being biased with not enough minority input because of socioeconomic differences, and they wanted your thoughts on that. Yes, great observation. I agree, and this is something we're very concerned about. Um, in order to run one of these language models, you cannot just do it on your laptop, right? OpenAI is different because we're accessing it, we're accessing the API, but the model itself is running on a multi-million dollar server, you know, in in a, in in OpenAI's headquarters. And we're seeing now this increasing divide because to actually do research on these language models, you need millions and millions of dollars of compute hardware, right? So only the wealthiest universities and the wealthiest companies are able to do this research now. And we're seeing much more of a divide between the less wealthy, the less socioeconomic advantaged um, institutions and communities uh, are having less access to these technologies. So yes, yeah, so this divide um, that AI seems to be exacerbating is something that we're very concerned about. 
All right, Shannon, all right. we are ready for you to bring us home. Thank you again, Dr. Licata, for sharing all of that great information with us. And to the audience, we'd like to thank you for all the great questions you asked. And if you have any questions about the library programs or resources, just go to hcplc.org forward slash contact, where you'll find all of our contact info, including our phone number, which is 813-273-3652. Also, to participate in more summer reading programs online and in branches, and branches you can get information at hcplc.org forward slash events. I hope you all have a great evening, and thank you for joining us.